Well, uh, thank you. Um, and I'd like to keep this uh, uh, really as informal as possible. So I have some slides um, that um, will hopefully serve some objectives and provide a background. And uh, then uh, please uh, ask questions, because I think I view that as the most critical aspect uh, of this session, uh, questions that are of relevance to you, um, your families, and your friends. Um, so I put down my uh, contact information, so uh, please don't hesitate uh, to email me in follow-up or uh, call and leave a message, and I will uh, respond either by email or calling you back. So I'll leave the slide up here uh, momentarily. Okay, so the objectives of my uh, comments are the following. First, I'd like to give you some data about uh, pancreatic cancer in general, then talk about the inherited or hereditary forms of pancreatic cancer, including uh, BRCA uh, mutations. And then in each of those inherited or hereditary forms of uh, cancer, talk about some of the clinical features uh, as well as the opportunities for genetic testing and counseling, and how the information that's gleaned from uh, genetic testing has an impact upon uh, clinical medicine. And then I'll um, switch gears and talk um, a little bit about uh, progress that's been made in the therapy of pancreatic cancer in general, and then uh, turn, turn it over to you. Uh, so, again, I'll talk a little bit about the incidence and epidemiology, the genetic uh, predisposition. Importantly, and I think this will be uh, answer, hopefully, a number of your questions or anticipate a number of questions, how to screen um, uh, individuals and family members who are at increased risk for pancreatic cancer, and then talk about therapy. So, um, unfortunately, um, pancreatic cancer is increasing in annual incidence uh, in the United States as well as across uh, the world. And whereas a number of years ago, uh, the cases might have been on the order of 30, 33,000, uh, in the most recent data uh, for 2013, there are over 45,000 new cases per year. Um, and unfortunately, it still is a, um, a, a leading cause of, of uh, our patients and families uh, passing away. Now, is it that um, the cancer is truly increasing? Um, I think so. And some of that may be uh, related to that we're living longer. Some of it is that um, patients and families are seeking attention when they may not have been uh, in the past. And some of it is our collective ability uh, to detect the disease uh, at various stages. So if you take a look at the general population in the United States, the average age of onset of pancreatic cancer is 67. It's earlier for the inherited or hereditary forms of um, of uh, pancreatic cancer. The most common um, subtype of pancreatic cancer, accounting for about 95% of all pancreatic cancer, is when the cancer arises in a, uh, in a part of the pancreas gland that's called the ductal cell. So this is often referred to as pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, or PDAC for short. Other types of cancer can arise in the pancreas, so we should be careful to distinguish these other subtypes because they have different behaviors, they have different uh, histories or outcomes. One of these is called neuroendocrine tumor, or NET for short, and I'm happy to elaborate upon that in the discussion period. These are uh, tumors that arise in the hormone-producing cells of the pancreas and typically are found in the tail of the pancreas and can really smolder along, can percolate along for years uh, before um, spreading. And we have very good therapies uh, for neuroendocrine tumors or 
NETs. Another uh, type of uh, to, uh, cancer that can arise um, in the pancreas is in the cell type that makes enzymes, so-called Astner cell uh, cancer. It's unusual. And actually, lymphomas can arise um, in the pancreas, um, as well as uh, sarcomas. So there are different types of cancers in the pancreas, but the most common, the most prevalent, is ductal adenocarcinoma, or PDAC, uh, for short. This gets into what I alluded to earlier, that the vast, vast majority of pancreatic cancers, or PDAC, so I'll, I'll use these synonymously, uh, are age-related. So this is true for um, a lot of diseases, whether they're benign disease or malignant disease, is that as we're living longer, we're, we're the subjects of, of, of diseases, uh, coronary artery disease, diabetes mellitus, hypertension, kidney disease, and a variety of different cancers. So what this shows you is that, um, remember I said that the average age for pancreatic cancer is 67, and it shows you in the general population as we approach our 60s and 70s and even our 80s, that's where we find the majority, not all, but the majority of pancreatic cancer cases. And individuals who present with pancreatic cancer may have no symptoms whatsoever, or they may have nonspecific symptoms, or they may have specific symptoms, which can be form a spectrum of symptoms. Um, pain that's in the upper abdomen, pain that's around uh, the umbilicus. Because pancreatic cancer uh, invades nerve fibers, pain can radiate uh, in, in, uh, to the mid-back. Individuals may have also nausea, vomiting, um, anorexia, diminished appetite. Because of all those symptoms, individuals may lose weight. And, and because the pancreas is shaped like a comet, uh, a head, a body, and a tail, um, the, the cancer often arises in the body, in, in the head, excuse me, and that's very close to the bile duct where bile flows out, and, and, and the mass or the cancer can obstruct the bile duct, and patients can also have what's called jaundice, yellowing of the eyes, yellowing of the skin, and that can lead to severe itching or pruritus. Um, so these are the spectrum of symptoms that um, patients can present with. And because patients may not have symptoms or nonspecific symptoms, they rightfully don't seek medical attention. And when patients do have symptoms, unfortunately, they're often at later stages. So although much advance has occurred in the last five, seven years in therapy, the key in any cancer is try to detect it before it's become cancer, so-called precancer, and I'll elaborate upon that, or early stage cancer. So by analogy, if you look at another disease that I, I, I see a lot of and I study is colon cancer. So normal colon to polyp the cancer, and that's why screening colonoscopy is done to detect polyp before a polyp can progress to cancer. So in that instance, it's the one cancer in which incidence is going down because we have a screening modality to remove precancerous lesions before they become cancer. But even if we detect cancer, the survival for uh, the outcomes for colon cancer is tremendous. We'd like to take that principle and apply it to pancreas cancer. So because most patients have symptoms when they present, and that is associated with later stages, a subset of patients will then present with the disease when it's spread outside that pancreas gland, that comet-shaped body, into local lymph nodes, to the liver, to the lining of the abdominal cavity, and so fluid can form uh, so-called ascites, and sometimes even to the lung. And that makes therapy challenging. Not unremitting, but challenging. And so um, patients with pancreas cancer will, div will present at a variety of stages shifted more towards um, late stage. 
So let's shift gears now, armed with this basic information about um, epidemiology and the general population. And if that's the average risk individual, are there situations in which um, individuals in the general population are at increased risk for pancreatic cancer, moderate risk or high risk? Okay. And so if you look now in the entire gastrointestinal tract, this is a theme. Okay. So that um, while the vast majority of gastrointestinal or digestive tract cancers occur in an age-dependent fashion, we know that there are inherited forms of, of cancers. In the colon, um, up to 30% of colon cancers have some familial basis. Sometimes we know the genes, but in the conditions I've listed, and I don't want you necessarily to dwell on it, um, there's the genetic mutations have been identified, genetic counseling is available, and sometimes that can translate into prophylactic colectomy. So you remove the colon and you can hook up internally and you remove the risk then of cancer developing. So we see a lot of that. Um, in the stomach, stomach cancer, which is not that common in the United States, but very common throughout the world, especially Far East Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, um, most cancers in the stomach develop in an age-dependent fashion, but occasionally it can develop very early in life, even patients in their 20s and 30s. And in the esophagus, the food pipe that leads to the stomach, uh, most cases occur in an age-dependent fashion, average risk, but occasionally there can be familial uh, clustering. So, I mentioned at the outset there are 44, 45,000 new cases of pancreatic cancer every year. It's estimated that about 5 to 10 percent have some familial or hereditary basis. And it, up to 10 percent of pancreatic cancer patients will have a first degree relative who will develop the cancer. So that is a term uh, uh, called penetrance. How likely is a gene mutation to manifest itself clinically in that family? Okay? So um, what are these risk factors? And I'm going to uh, walk you through them, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to be repetitive here. Um, one is an inflammatory condition called uh, pancreatitis. Remember, ITIS always means inflammation like tonsillitis, appendicitis. So hereditary pancreatitis. Another one is called familial atypical mole and melanoma syndrome, BAM for short. We'll talk about uh, what's uh, most interest to you, BRCA1 and 2. Lynch, which is a form of inherited uh, colon cancer. Poitiers, an uh, inherited form of colon cancer. And as Dr. Domchek mentioned, BRCA genes have properties that help repair uh, defects in DNA during DNA replication. Well, they're related genes to BRCA that are involved in DNA repair, and if you mutate them, if you change them, DNA repair is not maintained, so you have um, uh, DNA mismatch, mismatches being propagated in cell division from mother cell to daughter cell. And those genes related to BRCA are called PALB2 and ATM. So let's walk through these. Hereditary pancreatitis. So these are individuals who uh, present uh, typically in their teens and 20s, almost definitively before the age of uh, 30, and they will have broad inflammation in the enzyme-producing cells of the pancreas. And um, uh, acute pancreatitis is a common condition in adults. In hereditary pancreatitis, it's the same type of symptoms, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, but, not, but without weight loss, without yellow jaundice. Um, and um, it's, uh, it can progress to chronic pancreatitis, where there's chronic inflammation and scarring of the pancreas, and now the insulin-producing cells and the enzyme-producing cells malfunction or dysfunction. So we don't make enough insulin in these situations. So we, these patients can also have diabetes mellitus. 
They don't make enough enzymes for digestion and they can have diarrhea as a result. Okay, so that's hereditary pancreatitis. And factors, uh, there's certain factors that can aggravate this background, cigarette smoking uh, or alcohol or both. So the in pattern of inheritance is that if it's present in, in a parent, each child has a one in two chance of, of inheriting the predisposition to hereditary pancreatitis. This is so-called autosomal dominant. And if that trigger uh, for hereditary pancreatitis, the gene defect is present, then it's, it's likely to be pre present. Penetrant, uh, penetrance is 80%. And this is the uh, leading, uh, the highest risk uh, associated with an inherited form of uh, pancreatic cancer for uh, pancreatic cancer is hereditary pancreatitis. So these individuals over a lifetime have a 35-fold increased risk of pancreatic cancer. So it's repetitive bouts of, of, of pancreatitis developing into chronic pancreatitis, scarring of the tissue or fibrosis, and so it's bad inflammation, bad scars that then culminate in pancreatic cancer uh, in these individuals that's accentuated or exacerbated by cigarette smoking as well as um, alcohol. So the gene that's responsible for hereditary pancreatitis is called trypsinogen or, or cationic trypsinogen and the gene uh, name is called PRSS1. And suffice it to say um, that it, 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 it causes premature activation of an enzyme called trypsinogen, which attacks enzyme-producing cells and causes those cells to be injured and even drop out. So now the pancreas is not making enough enzymes for digestion. And it's very easy for a laboratory in a hospital or a commercial lab to detect the, where the mutation is located in the trypsinogen. There are other mutations, other gene mutations associated with hereditary pancreatitis that are listed for you here. So why, why test for hereditary pancreatitis? Well, young adults can have pancreatitis typically from alcohol or gallstones. 90% of the times it's due to that. Um, so it, it, it's an opportunity to distinguish uh, other factors that cause pancreatitis. Sometimes the patients can have, as I mentioned, nonspecific to specific symptoms. Sometimes hard to know, are these symptoms referable to pancreatitis? So it's a way for, to validate the patient's symptoms. It's a way to expedite the diagnosis and avoid a lot of repetitive and unnecessary testing. And then it's a way if, if an individual has the gene mutation, much like BRCA1 or 2, then it's a way to test at-risk family members if they have the mutation in trypsinogen. And it's also an opportunity to implement um, a preventive medicine. So these individuals should definitely be on a low-fat diet, avoid alcohol, and avoid um, cigarette smoking. So I'm going to skip through those diagrams. So that's hereditary pancreatitis early onset in life, repeated inflammation due to a, a mutation in a gene uh, called trypsinogen. So the next one is called familial atypical mole and melanoma syndrome, FAM for short. It's due to a, a, a gene mutation, a mutation in a gene called P16. And it was originally described in a variety of families um, in, in the Netherlands. And it's been um, uh, validated ever since over the course of the last 20 years uh, throughout the world. So these individuals in the bottom half of the slide um, uh, indicates uh, the definition of FAM. These individuals ha uh, will have typically more than two family members with melanomas. One member may have multiple melanomas. And one family member or more will have pancreatic cancer. 
So the key feature here is the skin findings. Individuals will have atypical moles, and there's definitions about how many moles, uh, what size these moles should be, melanomas. But intriguingly and curiously, these patients with atypical moles and melanomas will have a substantially increased risk of pancreatic cancer. And we, we have a number of families like this. And about 14, 15 years ago, um, in, in, in a university in Nebraska, two large families with these um, types of uh, P16 mutations were asked um, if they had, if they were found to have the P16 mutation, but the pancreas looked normal, they all agreed that they would undergo a prophylactic pancreatectomy or a Whipple surgery. So this is the one instance in hereditary pancreatic cancer where we do recommend prophylactic surgery, remove the uh, pancreas and reconfigure uh, the stomach and small intestine. Because, um, two reasons. One, these individuals develop pancreatic cancer very early in life, in their 20s and 30s. And second, imaging may look normal, but when you remove the pancreas and look at it under the microscope, there are microscopic foci of cancer. So this is an instance for prophylactic surgery. Next, and the most common causes of hereditary pancreatic cancer, remember, uh, I want to reinforce, if we have about 45,000 new cases every year, 5 to 10% are hereditary, and that's what I'm going over now. And within that hereditary, um, the highest uh, or the, the greatest number of cases associated with mutations in BRCA1 and 2. So BRCA1, as you know, um, is located on human chromosome 17. When mutations occur in BRCA1, it's autosomal dominant, and the, the protein is involved in, in DNA uh, repair. Um, this is a schematic or cartoon depiction of, of the gene. It, what it tells you is that the mutations are not found in one location, but distributed throughout the gene. So that's why you have to sequence the whole gene in order to try to detect a mutation. Likewise, BRCA2, it's on a different chromosome, human chromosome 13. It, too, has an autosomal dominant mode of transmission. It also is involved in DNA repair. Like BRCA1, mutations are not restricted to a discrete location, but spread throughout the gene, um, uh, enabling then uh, sequencing technology. So in, in a study of over 170 families with BRCA2 mutations comprising over 3,700 individuals, the relative risk for pancreatic cancer, this is over a lifetime, in such individuals is 3.5. But there's something about these BRCA2 mutations that pre increased risk for cancer in other sites as well, not, not only the pancreas, but prostate, the gallbladder, stomach, and skin. Okay. Because the BRCA2 enzyme is a very critical enzyme in basic um, uh, properties of a cell. And so if it's dysfunctional, one can imagine how critical that is for a cell in a tissue, and that's why different organs are affected to variable degrees with BRCA2 mutations, independent of breast and ovary. Um, well, what about BRCA1 uh, mutations or carriers? And if you look down the third column, relative risk for pancreas, it's 2.8. So it's more in BRCA2 for pancreas cancer than BRCA1, um, but other uh, uh, relative risk or, or other cancers that have increased relative risk for BRCA1 mutations include male breast cancer, uh, fallopian uh, tube, colon, and stomach. Okay, and let me conclude then this part of my talk with other conditions that predispose to pancreas cancer of a hereditary nature. One is called Poitiers-Jaeger's, in which adolescents and young adults have polyps in their small intestine and colon, 
And as they live longer, um, there's an increased risk of pancreatic cancer. And the gene mutation, uh, or the mutation is in the gene called STK11, so we can test for that. There's a neurologic condition called ataxia telangiectasia, a motor disorder where people have trouble walking or ambulating. Um, and there's increased risk of lymphomas and leukemias, and there may be an increased risk of pancreatic cancer as well. Um, so let me go over some um, um, uh, cases uh, in our own GI genetics clinic at the University of Pennsylvania. So the arrow um, points to an individual, uh, JG, who, who came to see us because of her family history. And um, just by way of uh, nomenclature in these um, family trees or family pedigrees, you try to go back as far um, in your generations as possible. Um, circles are women, uh, squares are men. There's a reason why men are squares. Um, and um, then you go in each successive generation. First degree relatives are parents, siblings, children. Second degree relatives are grandparents, uncles, aunts, um, and um, second cousins, or first cousins, and so forth, second degree, third degree. So JG, unfortunately, had um, her dad uh, pass away from pancreas cancer at age 49. Dad's brother, paternal uncle, died of pancreatic cancer in his 70s. And there's a first cousin um, who died of pancreas cancer in her 50s. Now, it turns out mom had colon cancer probably in an age-dependent fashion in her 70s. And then maternal grandparents, maternal grandfather had a brain tumor in his mid-70s, and maternal grandmother had either an ovarian or uterine cancer in 74. And she asked, well, what is my chance of getting pancreas cancer? Turns out that both sides of the family are of Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry. And we did um, uh, genetic testing in JG, and she turned out to have a BRCA2 mutation, even though there's no evidence of classic uh, breast cancer or ovarian cancer of the family. And we then offered that genetic testing to the two brothers. Uh, one of them had BRCA2 mutation, the other did not. Okay? So this is not a classic family for BRCA2, yet because of the penetrance of pancreas cancer and the Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, we were worried about that possibility. Here's another family. The arrow points to the uh, member who came to see us, MF. MF reports that dad died of pancreatic cancer at 65. Dad's dad, paternal grandfather, died of pancreatic cancer in around 50. And the father of that grandfather, great-grandfather, we don't know. And that's often the case with preceding generations. We just don't have information. We don't have, um, uh, it, it's by rec uh, verbal recollection. And even death certificates uh, will, will surmise what may have happened without proof. So um, sometimes it's hard to know. And it turns out a sibling also had a neuroendocrine tumor, an islet cell tumor. Well, it turned out this patient and family does not fit um, uh, BRCA1 or 2 or hereditary pancreatitis or poitz or or any of the DNA uh, repair genes. So this is not infrequent either where there's some family history. There's something going on. We don't know the gene mutation that's responsible as of now. Perhaps that information will avail itself in the, in the future. So what we do, and, and other centers across the uh, country do, is try to assign risk um, to such families that um, either have a gene mutation or, in this latter instance, don't have a gene mutation. So we say high risk is more than one first degree family member with pancreatic cancer before the age of 60. Moderate risk is a second degree, more than one second degree relative with pancreatic cancer before the age of 60. And low risk is whether it's a first degree or a second degree family member with pancreatic cancer after the age of 60, because then we're 
thinking about it in an age-dependent fashion where the average age is 67. And what we will do then is um, um, have our patients fill out questionnaires uh, in advance. Um, we'll send these questionnaires electronically um, um, or otherwise. And, and, and patients will fill out, to the best of their abilities, the information that they have or know about about their family history. And we'll do sort of a qualitative risk assessment. They might be low risk or moderate and high risk. And um, for research purposes, we'll draw blood and store it away for research studies that we're doing now, either at our center or in collaboration with other centers, or store blood because maybe something will occur, information will occur in the future, and we'll have this. All of this is approved in terms of uh, getting blood samples, um, is approved through our Institutional Review Board, or IRB, and all the samples are, are barcoded and de-identified. So nobody knows, nobody can make the link between a patient's name and identity with that sample. It's absolutely critical um, for uh, privacy. And so if there is an increased risk for pancreatic cancer by virtue of family history, and I think this will anticipate a number of your questions, be happy to elaborate, then most centers um, across the world, um, including ours, um, argue for screening. And so the question comes up, what to screen with and how often to screen? Well, the modalities, because the pancreas is not um, easily accessible by physical examination, it's, it's deep in the abdominal cavity, so one cannot feel it by physical exam, one has to image it, okay? And the imaging can either be direct or invasive or non-invasive. Non-invasive can be in the following forms. An ultrasound, but I can assure you ultrasound is really absolutely no good for imaging the pancreas, so dismiss that from your thinking and discussion. The next is a CAT scan, so that's, that's pretty good, so you can actually get very detailed slices of the pancreas. About the only downside of using a CAT scan repetitively on a regular basis is that there is some uh, radiation exposure um, and that could become cumulative over time. The next is magnetic resonance imaging or MRI and that's quite good for imaging the pancreas and if you inject a certain dye with that you can also image uh, the tree and the branches within the pancreas or this comet-shaped gland. So these are non-invasive approaches to imaging the pancreas. Invasive-wise, it's called endoscopic ultrasound, or EUS for short. So this involves um, fasting after its outpatient, fasting after midnight, no preparation otherwise, like for a colonoscopy, no cathartic is necessary to purge the, the bowel. And um, um, you, you um, get an intravenous line and you get medications to make you um, sleepy. It can be conscious sedation involving um, a benzodiazepine sedative versed, which is like Valium, as well as a narcotic analgesic. Uh, like more member of the morphine family, or sometimes patients want to be totally asleep, and it involves a form of anesthesia uh, called propofol. Either one is fine. And so what it involves is then is taking an endoscope, the diameter of one's finger, longer two, um, which is then passed to the back of the mouth, and it passes very easily under sedation, into the esophagus or food pipe, stomach, into the small intestine, and it has an ultrasound probe at the end of it. So while I did say dismiss an ultrasound, dismiss it when it's on the abdominal surface because the intervening fat muscle bowel doesn't allow good visualization of the pancreas, but an ultrasound is still allows good visualization of the pancreas when there's nothing in, in between. So the ultrasound probe at the end of the endoscope then is almost, is, is almost right next to the pancreas within the small intestine. So it's a great view of that comet-shaped gland. 
Okay, does that make sense to everybody? An EUS takes about 15 minutes to do, about an hour, uh, uh, maybe 30, 40 minutes waiting before the procedure, an hour of recovery from uh, the medications wearing off, go home, okay? And the uh, additional, so studies have shown that the EUS is equivalent to, if not better than CAT scan or MRI, so that's good. The additional advantage of an EUS is that if by chance there's an abnormality in the pancreas, then a little needle can be put in, cells can be obtained, and right there at our center we have our pathologist who will look at these cells under the microscope and say, well, I need more cells to look at, or these cells maybe uh, don't look too good, you know, um, then, then we've got to, you know, do further follow-up. So that's called cytocell pathology. Okay, so that's the advantage of an EUS. So those are the ways to image um, and therefore screen for pancreas cancer. The other question that comes up is how often? And I would say most centers, including our own, recommend doing it every year. And the next question that comes up is when to start. And there's a, this is the subject of much debate, and we can elaborate upon that. But suffice it to say that um, sooner rather than uh, later. Okay, some brief comments about therapy. As Dr. Domchek mentioned in her talk, um, those individuals who, who are with a BRCA mutation who are otherwise don't have any other markers um, like estrogen receptor positivity or progesterone receptor positivity um, are eligible for PARP or PARP inhibitors, and she outlined um, the studies that are outgoing uh, um, uh, at the University of Pennsylvania and other sites. So this is a big breakthrough. Um, uh, but that being said, the, the, uh, the primary therapy for pancreas cancer in the general population uh, is surgery. Uh, most of the pancreas is removed. There's rechanneling, replumbing, if you will, of the stomach with the small intestine. And that procedure is named after the surgeon who first described it or invented it and implemented it as uh, George Whipple over 100 years ago. So that's why it's called the Whipple surgery or Whipple procedure. And here, if, the can if pancreas cancer is found early, it's really the best type of therapy for early stage pancreas cancer. But um, we know, however, that we can supplement after surgery with different types of chemotherapy. So you may have heard about gemcitabine, and that interferes with DNA replication. So after Whipple surgery, patients may be candidates for uh, gemcitabine or other types of chemotherapy, um, the acronym or abbreviation called fulfirinox, which involves four uh, agents. And um, perhaps uh, the latest advance in uh, helping our patients after surgery with adjuvant, which means post-operative, post-surgery chemotherapy, is something called abraxane, which is um, taking advantage of a drug that's been actually around for almost 50 years um, called um, Taxol. And this Taxol has been bound uh, uh, to uh, nanoparticles so that it's um, much easier to administer and it gets to the pancreas cancer better and it sticks around longer. Okay? And as a result, um, it's been shown in, in a landmark study less than a year ago um, that after surgery, um, um, abraxane or this, or this uh, bead-bound plaxitaxel is better, with gemcitabine, is better than gemcitabine alone. So I make these comments to underscore a critical point that the stereotypic response um, in the general population is diagnosis of pancreas cancer, you know, 
total pessimism. I'd like to underscore quite the opposite. Through a lot of research and clinical trials, that, that the future is extremely bright uh, for therapy of pancreas cancer. Therapies that are constantly being improved upon by identifying specific target, therapies that will be even more effective if and when, I would say when we detect pancreas cancer early, and therapies that will be the most effective and modified therapies like PARP inhibitors when we can take screening and surveillance strategies and possibly detect pancreas cancer before it becomes pancreas cancer when it's precancer. So I'll conclude there, and I hope these uh, introductory comments have been helpful, and most importantly, I'd uh, welcome your questions. So thank you.